This week on Motor Week, we look at those ever popular showstoppers, the concept cars. This year, we've been spoiled with a range of cars from Chrysler launched in Detroit, as well as offerings from Bentley, Mitsubishi, and of course, Mercedes. Anybody worried that the merger of those two motoring giants, Chrysler and Daimler-Benz, would produce a list of bland copycat vehicles just needs to wander around their stands here at the Detroit Motor Show. Now this is the first outing of the two since their marriage and they've done it in real style, each producing a range of dazzling vehicles that reflect their own individual and very different styles. It's an opportunity to let the young designers uh, do whatever they want to do. There, there's no restrictions in terms of, of, of generally in terms of packaging or how much money they can spend on doing a concept. So it really blows the cobwebs away. Subtlety is not a word we normally associate with America, so it should come as no surprise that they produce vehicles like this. This is the Charger. And no, it's not some exotic foreign supercar. It's actually made by the same people that produce the good old Dodge pickup truck. Yes, this is another wacky concept from Chrysler, the company that somehow always managed to steal the show here in Detroit with their exotic birds of steel. Oh yes, the Charger is a muscle car all right, but it's one that lets you cruise with a clear conscience. That's because this 4.7 supercharged V8 runs on environmentally friendly compressed natural gas. Gas that generates 325 brake horsepower. Now, at the moment, this technology is very expensive. The storage tanks alone cost around two and a half thousand dollars, compared to fifty to hundred dollars for a petrol tank. But five years ago, the tank would have cost five thousand dollars. The Prowler and the Viper were two concepts: a sports car and a, and a hot rod, and they appeal, if you will, to the to the, uh, the the sort of Mopar muscle car crowd. And so it was only natural. Somebody said, "Well, why don't we revive the Charger and do?" something along those lines. So it doesn't have a stronger design thesis as some of the other vehicles like the, the Jeep Commander or the Dodge Power Wagon. But there's a following, a cult there that have said for years, why don't you do something like that? You know, that's the kind of car I'd really like to see you do again. So we did it. <laughs> you get if you cross a luxury sports saloon with the brawn of a butch 4x4 and a powertrain that belongs somewhere in the future. The answer is the Citadel, a kind of very upmarket estate that would make it extremely difficult for the Joneses to keep up with. It's not only a hybrid in, in, in uh, uh, market position or, 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 or vehicle concept, but a hybrid in, in powertrain too. And there's a great deal of interest worldwide in, in hybrids. Uh, typically a hybrid is a vehicle that's got two power sources, perhaps an internal combustion engine and an electric motor. Uh, but it's a real challenge to, to do that cost effectively. So what we try to do in the Citadel, and we've done this in some other concept hybrids also, is to try to um, come up with a hybrid configuration that, that that is intrinsically lower cost. Yep, if you fancy trading up your luxury 4x4 and you're not quite sure what you could top it with, then this is the answer. It's another of those vehicles that's a blend of different styles, a crossover vehicle, which seems to be all the rage here at Detroit this year. And it doesn't just cross over in terms of style, because the power also comes from two very different sources. A gas engine propels the rear wheels and electricity drives the front, giving you V8 power with V6 fuel economy. People are not going to buy boring cars, you know, cars without performance. It's been very apparent to us in the United States that you can't sell economy for economy's sake or cleanliness for cleanliness sake. I mean, the vehicle's got to be exciting and stimulating. And so in that case, it's a 325 horsepower supercharged V8. Uh, it's got tremendous performance, but by using CNG, which is intrinsically clean, and packaging it, as I say, in a very elegant way, we're able to get 300 miles of range into a vehicle without really taking up any of the luggage space. Inside, you feel as though you've wandered into an upmarket Swiss shopping centre. There's plenty of exclusive, expensive leather and an overload of rather beautiful Swiss watches at the front. Oh yes, I can see the hunting and the fishing set going for this in a big way. This beast is an enormous 77 inches tall and it's helped to those dizzy heights by these giant 35 inch tyres. And the Power Wagon is a name from Chrysler's past. It was around in the 40s, the 50s and the 60s. You could find it on the school run, the farm, at work as an emergency vehicle and also, not surprisingly, as a tow truck. What would those versions make of this 90s style with its stainless steel interior, its ash and its plush leather seats? 
Well, it may well have gone all designer with a designer feel to match, but it's still a vehicle that will get you above and beyond the call of duty. Well, Dodge has three words that, that epitomize their image, which is bold, powerful and capable. And I think with the power wagon, we just decided that we didn't know where to stop with each, all three of those words. And so we had a great time doing it. And um, it, it's just such an exciting vehicle to look at, but also to climb up into it. You know, to, the fact that you actually have to climb up into this thing, that's a special event in itself. And it, it's, it's part of the magic of it. Every motor show, wherever it is in the world, has a big story. And a big story here at Geneva this year is this. It's a Bentley, unveiled to the world's motoring press today to amazement. And it's not just the car that's the story either. Halfway along it nestles, or I don't know if I should say nestles really about something so huge, the engine. It's a V16, 8 litre, over 620 brake horsepower. It's a monster of a thing, and every bit a proper Bentley engine. In fact, if we're to get our letters of the alphabet right, that glorious engine isn't a V, it's a W16. It uses technology similar to that found in the W12 engine used by Volkswagen in their supercar. And looking at the Bentley, it must be said that it does have something, well, rather European about it. Bentleys traditionally have 25 feet long bonnets with the engine nestling in there, not in the middle. In fact, you could say it looks rather as though somebody has taken a Bentley grille and hammered it crudely into the front end of pretty much any European supercar. We had this ambition that uh, if we wanted to push the boundaries of Bentley further than they've been pushed in recent years at least, then something like this was going to be a good thought provoker and would give us the views of people, whether they be journalists, customers, aficionados for the mark as to whether this is the sort of direction we could go. Now, bear in mind that W.O. Bentley made the name for the company in the 1920s and 30s with supercars at the time. We were winning Le Mans five times in the 20s, so it's not exactly a departure for us. It's perhaps going back to something we've done before, but not in this guise, that's for sure. Yeah, and you certainly can't go too far down the tradition line because it's mid-engine. Why did you go mid-engine with this concept? I guess when you think supercar, you think mid-engine. It needn't be, but that tends to be the recognised uh, configuration. Um, this is a concept car, so it's unlikely level to go into production anyway. Um, so if we did decide to do something, it could be in any different direction. It wouldn't have to be mid-engine. At the eagerly awaited launch to the world's press of this car and of this engine, you said that this is a statement of intent. Now. It could be said that it's kind of a European thing to do, to put the engine in the middle. I mean, are we going to see more of a move towards a European kind of product, something less idiosyncratic than, no, than in I the don't past? Think so. I don't think so. I mean, you've got a very big engine there. And don't forget, this concept car does two things. Yes, it's a statement of intent for Bentley as a mark. It's also a test bed for the engine itself. It's the introduction of this 16-cylinder, 8-litre engine. Um, we haven't made an 8-litre engine for a long time, not since the 1930s. So um, it is a test bed for that engine, and the engine will probably go into a future generation of mainstream Bentley products. So replacement for some of the existing four and two-door cars that we have in a number of years' time. So the engine is far more likely to make it into production than the car will. And the engine is very much a Bentley product. You've described it has certain characteristics that people now associate with a Bentley engine. That's right. I mean, let's be clear, it couldn't have happened without the support of our colleagues at Volkswagen, where the, where the engine has been produced. It follows a, a family of engines that they've been working on. They've uh, not long ago introduced an 18-cylinder engine for the Bugatti concept, which is a different makeup to this. This is uh, along the same lines as the W12. I won't try and explain the engineering aspects of it because I'd make a fool of myself, but uh, as you say, what we did set out to do from the very beginning of this development programme was to produce an engine with them that had characteristics that a Bentley owner would recognise. Lots of torque, very low down in the rev range, so you've got that seamless tidal wave of power right the way through the rev range. It could be said as well that this is a good time for raising the image of Bentley. You're deliberately trying to push Bentley at the moment. We are. I mean, when Volkswagen bought the company, they knew what our 10-year product plan was, and they obviously bought into that by buying the company. We wanted to say, well, where are we going beyond that? And this is why in the very earliest days of our relationship with them, we put some ideas to them which they took to their heart, and they said, well, which of these various ideas would you like to pursue? And we said this one, and that happened to be just the one they'd like to pursue as well. So it's a statement of intent in that way, as you said before, in that uh, we think that we can push the parameters out further beyond our live product plan, if you like, to see where we could go beyond that. This is uh, John Hull, who is the designer of what is without doubt the biggest eye-catcher at this show, and that's a fairly large statement. John, 
what uh, were you attempting to do with this vehicle and give us a bit of background about it? Well, with uh, the SUV market being so oversaturated right now, we wanted to try to approach this vehicle in a very different way. So we're trying to combine the aspects of a high performance sports car with the utility of a sports utility vehicle. It has uh, a very, very aggressive stance to it. Uh, a rumor tells me that it was actually codenamed Mad Max, is that right? Yes, yes, that was an uh, internal code name for the project when we were working on it. Uh, and then the final name uh, that we came up with was uh, SSU. And that stands for? The Sophisticated uh, Sports Utility. It looks like the type of vehicle that old Mad Max, if he was uh, being played by Mel Gibson, would be cruising around California in now. Would you think you could have a buyer there? Uh, yes, uh, that's, what, that's what we hope. We're trying to use this uh, as an opportunity to gauge uh, the public's reaction, whether or not they would actually like a car like this, and then with the possibility in the future that it might go into production. Just how wide is it? Because that's one of the biggest things that hit you straight away. It looks absolutely huge. It is. It's, uh, it's really wide. It's almost as wide as a Hummer. It's actually three inches wider than the Suburban. And could you actually put it into production um, if you got the go-ahead? Well, there are certain things that would have to be toned down a little bit. Uh, this is a concept car. Uh, there's uh, several features that are over-exaggerated, but the overall theme could be translated into a production vehicle. And what sort of engine has this got in it? It has a V6, it's a VR4, all-wheel drive all the time. Uh, it's 310 horsepower, twin turbo. Still to come after the break, we look at more concepts from Jeep, Chevrolet, Cadillac and Mercedes. General Motors is the world's number one car maker. It's got a staggering 77 models in its lineup. But recently it's had problems. Critics have panned its cars for being too dull, too boring. They say compared to Ford, it's looking a bit frumpy. Well, GM have come to this show with all guns blazing. They've brought out no fewer than five concept cars from their different brands, which they say proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that boring is the last thing they are. They're bold, they're adventurous, and some of them are downright outrageous. Now this, even by American standards, is seriously wacky. It's a case of, is it an estate? Is it a four by four? Is it a sports coupe? The answer is, it's the Chevrolet Nomad, and Chevrolet say that it's a crossover. For me, it looks like a DIY hot rod that somebody's put together in the back of their garage. But it does look absolutely sensational. No one will ignore you if you're driving down the street in this machine. Chevy say that the Nomad is the estate car for the family man who likes to seriously motor. It's got all the versatility you'd expect for an estate, but with a 5.7 V8 engine, it goes like the clappers. This is serious fun for the family man who wants to be a lot different. The Nomad has another little priceless gem. It's got an amazing 36-inch opening concertina roof that just pushes back like 50s style to the front of the car, turning it into an open-top sports car. Now that's what I call serious versatility for the family man. Chevy say that the Nomad is the estate car for the family man who likes serious fast motoring. A car that will handle like a coupe, but that's got all the versatility inside of the typical family estate. The seats inside all fold down, so it's practical, as well as looking absolutely outrageous. It's got a 5.7 litre V8 engine that will provide enough performance of a small supercar. For my mind, this is a classic example of a car that even makes the Chevy Corvette, one of the great names in motoring, look a bit staid and sensible. Now Chrysler may have a stage absolutely jam-packed with loads of concepts and its new partner Mercedes-Benz just won, but what a beauty it is. This gorgeous creature behind me is called the Vision SLR. I've got to say, it suits its name perfectly. 
It really is a vision to look at. It's a blend of the McLaren Mercedes F1 racing car and it has the contours and style of the legendary SLR sports cars of the 50s. Together with state-of-the-art technology, they create a Mercedes GT supercar for the 21st century. And of course, supercar looks need supercar power to be able to rival the likes of Ferrari. So Mercedes have developed the V8 engine from the S-Class. In Vision SLR, this 5.5-litre eight-cylinder engine produces a blistering 557 brake horsepower. Its top speed and awesome 190 miles per hour. 0 to 60 takes just 4.2 seconds. 0 to 120, an astonishing 11.3 seconds. And with performance figures like that, and if it makes it into production, a price tag of oh, around £200,000, this could be the ultimate toy for the David Beckhams and the Michael Owens of the next millennium. Think of the magic of American motoring, think of the excesses of American motoring, and the first name you'll come up with is Cadillac. Elvis Presley, pink Cadillac, and ever since then there have been endless, huge American cars that immediately spring to mind the name Cadillac. Well, this is the sensational new face of Cadillac. This is their 21st century idea of it, and it's coming to Europe soon. But I really think that Cadillac should have gone the whole hog and simply called it the evocative, because that's what this car is. From whatever angle you look at, this car shouts, look at me. It is absolutely sensational. It's also the car that Cadillac think they can take on the big guns of Europe, the luxury Mercedes 500 SL and Jaguar's XKR. I think they've got the right material to take it on because this is a car that may be big, but it's only really the size of a Vauxhall Amiga. And yet it's got massive road presence. And I think that it will suit European tastes better than any American car I've seen in the last 20 years. The Evoc not only looks like a million dollars, but inside it's got more high-tech gadgetry than you'd get on the Starship Enterprise. It's got a computer system called Communiport, which sounds like something uh, Captain James T. Kirk would love. That system basically will do just about anything. It'll navigate you. You can book seats at the theater or at a restaurant by voice command. It will even link up with your office computer. It's got everything on board here to survive and to run as a daily office. But the Evox real star turn is a thing called night vision. That's an amazing system where it has sensors in the front bumpers that flash pictures onto the screen which show the road ahead at night but beyond the vision of normal headlights. It's like having x-ray vision. It spots ahead potential hazards miles before you can see them making this one of the safest cars you're ever likely to drive on the road. Those of you that can see the, the front valence, there's a camera mounted, which is an infrared camera developed by Raytheon. Uh, it was used extensively in Desert Storm. It's used by a lot of law enforcement. And quite frankly, what it does is it picks up heat. Uh, the night vision camera will be first offered on the 2000 DeVille. We are the very first manufacturer ever to offer night vision as an, as an option. The night vision camera can see six times the distance of, of your normal headlamps. Therefore, if you're coming around a curved road and somebody's off to the side of the road changing your tire, the night vision is going to see that much sooner than your headlamps are going to see it. Uh, certainly here in Michigan, we have a large deer population. Uh, there's a tremendous number of accidents that happen every year with deers running across out of fields. Uh, people see them at the last minute. This will show you that. So for occupant protection and crash avoidance, uh, night vision will be one of the very first technologies. Although Cadillac say that the Evoque is only at this stage a concept car, they're happy to confirm off the record that this will go into production in very similar form within 18 to 24 months and it will come to the UK. Pricing it is a bit difficult at the moment, but if you look somewhere between 40,000 and 60,000, you're going to get uh, pretty close to the mark with it. I actually think that this is going to be a huge winner and will make a breakthrough for an American car with real European appeal. All I'd like to really say with this wonderfully high-tech car of the future is beam me up, Mr. Scott, and take me out onto the roads with it because that would really be the treat. This car deserves to get onto the road as soon as possible.
Now the snow here is everywhere and it's a reminder of just why the Americans love their big 4x4s and their huge pickup trucks so much. But if you're a Hollywood star and you all want to pile into a pickup to get through the snow or to do a spot of home improvements in, what kind of car do you buy? The answer to that question is a truck in a tux, which is how Ford's Lincoln Mercury division describe this, the Blackwood. This concept vehicle really is luxury taken to another level. It features 20 square feet of fine African wood, each band of which is defined with aluminium strips. The bucket seats are trimmed in no less than Connolly leather, and you can't fail to miss those massive 19-inch tyres. Power on this giant truck comes from a 5.4 litre V8, and it has enough towing capability for a boat or a horse trailer. This rather expensive toy is aimed at the discerning customer who won't flinch at parting with around 30,000 grand for a truck. Coming up on next week's show, in preparation for our trip to the 2000 Detroit Auto Show, we bring you the highlights of Detroit 1999 with Ginny Buckley, Ian Royal and Ken Gibson. All that next week on MotorWeek.